Well, something a little different here today, guys. I have my son, Caleb, with me. Caleb is my rock star, superstar. But Caleb's gonna be my cameraman for this job. And so we'll see how it goes. I haven't had a cameraman before, and now I do. So, let's do it. Get my seatbelt on. There's no, dude, there's no, there's no seatbelt buckle. It's seriously missing. I can't wear my seatbelt. Everyone's gonna give me all kinds of crap. There's seriously the buckles missing on this seat. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't buckle the seatbelt. All right, what are we working on? This is a Jeep with a misfire. In fact, I didn't even enter year, maker, model yet, but let me read it to you. We got a little info from the customer. This is a 2001 Jeep Grand Cherokee reading the customer's words here missing at idle sputtering and choking until complete stall while driving and at idle okay complete loss of power they have parentheses electrical when coasting or coming to a stop so that sounds like the uh, vehicle is stalling changed crank and cam sensors o2 sensor spark plugs and coil pack removed cat converter so there's no cat on the vehicle i don't did they reinstall it i don't know uh problem has not been as frequent since i stopped in last week ugh that's what i say is ugh when we have a vehicle that's intermittent okay don't give me crap about my seat belt i can't wear my seat belt because it doesn't exist all right i'm, I'm gonna grab the trouble codes out of this next so we do have a check engine light on uh, let me get you on the scan tool here and we'll read the codes. Let me ID the vehicle first. It is a Jeep 2001. We should be able to use an automatic ID. Yeah, four liter. It is not missing right now. It feels fine. In fact, I drove it from over on the other side of the parking lot to here and I felt nothing at all. But let's see what kind of codes we have. Maybe we'll get some direction with codes. Oh, wow. We have ignition coil number one primary. Ignition coil, uh, and then a whole bunch of misfire codes. So ignition coil one, two, and three primary circuit faults. Interesting. Here's the hard part about this. This coil pack was replaced. I don't know when it was replaced, and I don't know if any codes were cleared after it was replaced. I just felt a miss right there. I don't know if you felt that, Caleb. Yeah, there was a little bit of a that, flutter. Yeah. Yeah. We may not need to test drive it. If I can make it misfire right here, that's good enough for me to not worry about a test drive. All right, what I wanna look at, guys, is um, I can feel this misfiring now, so I don't, I don't think a test drive is gonna be necessary, uh, but what I'll do, and Caleb, I can show you this too, possibly, is we're gonna look um, at misfire counters. And uh, this will be twofold. I'll be able to teach you guys while I'm teaching my son, which is pretty cool. So this is actually showing me each cylinder, Caleb, one through six. And then what you do basically is you're looking at which one has the most number of misfires. And you see cylinder five obviously has more misfires than the rest of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a way to give you good direction as far as where you're going. I don't like the fact that we have misfires on every cylinder code wise and these primary ignition fault codes. But again, I don't know if some of these codes were there from before and they never cleared the faults. That's the hard part about what we do sometimes. Um, so to be honest with you guys, what I'm gonna do on this vehicle, because I really wanna know if these primary faults are coming back, I'm gonna clear these codes out. Let's just make sure we have these right. All right, so 351, 352, and 353 are my primary circuit faults. And let's go back and we'll clear these. Conditions not met. Even though it tells you to shut the engine off, turn the key on to do this, a lot of vehicles, you can clear faults by skipping that. You can just do it with it running didn't work this time but anyway um, what we want to do after clearing faults reread them make sure they're gone so they are now gone restart the vehicle check engine lights off and now we have a blank slate so anything that sets now would be new and then we can disregard the old codes if they were old codes I have a feeling that they're not I can feel the miss on a rev you feel that kind of yeah 
just holding it at a higher RPM for a minute. Picking up misfires on every cylinder. Even though right now I don't feel the misfires, the counters are showing them. Why is it showing on every cylinder? Why is it while it's not misfiring? Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, it really shouldn't be. I mean, we can see where all of our misfire trouble codes were coming from. It had misfire codes on every cylinder. Ooh. What was that? Every time I rev it, it'll miss. Let's go for a quick ride just because I would like to maybe feel uh, what this feels like on the road. Although we could get ourselves in trouble too because it's a stalling issue. We just have to be careful. Not sure really what data is important, but uh, let's just do it real quick. Just real quick test drive here. Not that it's completely necessary, but let's see what she feels like. Pretty bad miss on acceleration there. I don't think, it doesn't feel like a lean condition to me uh, because we're misfiring at idle, so I'm not really worried about what my O2 is doing at wide open throttle. And I'll tell you what, that particular feeling, all of that, it actually felt like every cylinder to me, not a single cylinder. That particular like kind of skip or, or misfire was like the whole engine momentarily shutting off, just like the customer described. So the test drive really didn't help us any, any more than sitting still, but it's important still to test drive a vehicle because you never know, like here's what can happen. I've seen this you know, many times, a vehicle like this that clearly lack of maintenance, you focus on the engine system, you, you get it running right, you spend, you know, however much money to get the engine running right, and then when you're done, you go test drive it, only to find out the transmission slipping. So, you know, the question then becomes, do you wanna do the work on the car to fix the engine when your transmission's slipping? So the, t the test drive's really important, and I don't emphasize it to my own students enough, how important the test drive is. In this particular case, didn't really help us give us better direction. It feels ignition related. Uh, that's the direction we're going, especially because we had those primary circuit fault codes. Again, there's a question there is, were those history codes that were never cleared? We don't know, but I think that's a, a good starting point. A visual inspection of the wiring harness that runs to that coil pack might be in order. Check engine light did not come back on would be nice to duplicate those primary ignition faults. But scan data is really not important. I'm not going through my normal O2 wide open throttle test, looking at other data parameters, throttle position map, um, coolant sensors. None of that matters to me right now because of the feel of a misfire and the codes that we had. Uh, we're going right after the secondary ignition system on this or the ignition system in general, not just the secondary, but the primary. All right, so first thing I wanna do, Caleb, and for the rest of you, we take a look in here at this ignition coil pack and uh, maybe just kind of do a visual. You know what? There's coolant leak in here. You see all these drops, see this stuff here? This is an indication of a coolant leak. In fact, there it is right there. Look, the rad's cracked. What's happening there is uh, that coolant is being sprayed back. That could be a factor too, that we're getting antifreeze on the coil pack housing and uh, it's making it wet and misfire. That's possible. And that's pretty bad. And that's gonna be worse the hotter this engine gets. In fact, that's a safety hazard for you and I as we're standing here um, in that uh, this is a pressurized cooling system and we have a leak. The next step, uh, I think, for me is uh, I'm gonna grab an amp probe and get it around this primary circuit and see what my coil firings look like. We'll do that. I'm trying to go after the wiring harness that connects right here where my finger is. Okay. Is the wiring harness that goes to the coil pack. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna strip this back so I can get the jaws of this amp clamp around the wire. So we have four wires and the, what we have is one common power feed and then three controls. And uh, what I wanna do to read all 
all of the current pattern for all of these coils is I want to grab the power feed, which is my green and orange. So I'm setting my amp probe on a 20 amp setting. I want to zero it. We'll put the jaws of this, the arrow here indicates direction of current flow, conventional theory. So what I want to do is my green with an orange tracer is going into the coil pack this way. I want to put the, the arrow facing the way that conventional theory current flow would be, which is that direction. Now I'll get you guys focused on the screen. What we want to do is um, go to our lab scope and I'm going to pick low amp 20. Let's get our settings here. So detail and repetition is what we want. What we want to see for this is nice even ramps uh, on all three of these coils. And more importantly for this particular one, I'm worried about them dropping out. And so I actually want to pick a longer time base for this particular scenario. I want to see multiples on the screen. I'm not so much worried about the detail as I am when this misfires, am I actually missing one of these ramps? One of the things you want to remember as you're looking at multiple firings on the screen and you start increasing your time base this applies to any scope you're using notice how the spikes are high and low now that's because the sample rate of the scope is not changing and we're actually missing some of those signals so what you want to do is up your sample rate by hitting peak detect that's specific to this unit that's specific to the snap on units uh, but longer time bases, we want to make sure that we have our sample rate increased. And for you guys that don't know what I'm talking about, sample rates, scope settings, I have a few videos where I've talked about sample rate, trigger, and all of that. And um, I will put those links in the description of this video for you guys that maybe are new to using a scope so you have a better idea of what I'm talking about. But I have my sample rate as high as it will go with this tool. This is a pretty good setting. Oh, there was a nice capture right there. Right there. Unless I was seeing things, there it is, right there. What that means to me, just first view, is this coolant leak that I'm worried about and moisture getting into the coil and all that is irrelevant now. That has nothing to do with it. When you have a primary control uh, issue like this, we're talking about computer wiring, crank sensor, um, you know, rubbing on the flywheel, something along those lines. This is not a coil pack issue. This is a control issue. Uh, that's a pretty damn good capture right there. Let's see if we can get a couple more of those. But this is what I'm talking about as far as detail and repetition. In, in our case, because of the intermittent nature of this misfire, we are more, more concerned about the repetition part uh, than we were the detail. So each one of these triangle looking pieces would be each of those coils firing and they fire one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, okay? Um, so uh, as far as what they look like in detail, this is, this is what each of those look like. There's a lot of theory that's involved in why it looks like a ramp and, and uh, there's, you know, turn on oscillations and turn off oscillations. And on this particular one, you actually can't even see turn on oscillations, which doesn't tell me anything. There's characteristic differences with coils, but that's a good looking ramp. Uh, did you see that little small one there? That was not good looking. And it's a good reason why we want to see repetition. The detail is there, but I wanna see what is this thing doing repeatedly over and over. We want to see repetition. And so let's watch that again. See that little short one there? Yeah. There's that right there. There was a whole bunch of crap that just happened that we do not want to see right there. See the weird breakups in that? Yeah. Over to the left, see all these ones to the right, they're nice and clean, like right over in right. here, right? Those all look great. Um, over on the left side of the screen, we're having multiple events that are taking place. 
should not look like that. So the question for us is, well, the question is why is it doing that? Why are we getting multiple events in there? And uh, to be honest with you, what that says to me is the computer is controlling it improperly. In other words, this is not a wiring problem. This is a computer that's doing something stupid because it's got a bad input. There are two inputs we worry about with this, cam and crank. Those sensors were just replaced. This is a good indicator of potentially the crank sensor is actually rubbing on the flywheel, giving false signals. So for the computer to be able to fire these coils properly, it needs to know where in time the engine is, and that's what the crank and cam sensors do, and that's the direction we're going. I, I wanna look at the crank sensor while we're, while we're looking at this. See the breakups in that signal again. I'm gonna grab another channel, and we're gonna back probe, um, we're gonna back probe cam and crank together and see if we can um, see where this anomaly is coming from. Okay. So this is an output that we're looking at here that we see a problem and now we're going to look at the inputs and compare the two. So you think it might be like an input issue with like... Um, well, keep in mind. I know what you mean, but I can't yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Well, there's a lot of background information that you don't have, Caleb. Yeah, and course. for you guys that are watching this, I want I'm going to use this opportunity to plug my other channel. I have a, another YouTube channel. It's called Scanner Danner Premium. And what I'm doing on that channel, guys, is I teach at a technical college, and I have recorded all of my classroom lectures um, where I'm teaching my class this stuff. So for my son Caleb to follow along in what we're doing, there's a lot of background information that you would need, and there's a lot of theory that you need, operation, description, and then you start plugging it into the actual troubleshooting, and that's what I'm doing on my other channel. So look me up. Scanner Danner Premium, you can take my college class, essentially, by uh, watching that channel. And it's 10 bucks a month. Where, where are you gonna get a college yeah. class for $10 a month? You're not, anywhere. No, seriously, give me one year and I'll change your life. If you're a mechanic, you're just getting into the game, you're um, a new guy getting in, into mechanics for the first time, in either of those situations, what I'm teaching is foundational, fundamental stuff that literally I can change your life by allowing you to make an income level that is above the normal parts changing mechanic. All right, so inputs is what we're talking about, Caleb. There's a crank sensor that's on the flywheel and a cam sensor that lives here, and we're gonna tap into both of those and get a signal, and once I pull it up on the screen, I'll be able to explain it better. All right, so I'm, I'm going to back probe the crank connector, and it's gonna be difficult for you to see our lighting's bad here, but that is my crank sensor connector, right where my finger is. The wire we wanna go after, this is like all Chrysler's, is the, I think it's tan, shoot, there's so much oil on this. There's an orange, there's a black and uh, with a blue tracer, which is the ground. The orange is the reference. And then it's like tan and yellow, I think, or gray and black. So I'm back probing the signal of the crank. That should not have unplugged that way. That can be a concern in itself, like the connector of this. That's the crank. And the cam is this little white thing here, Caleb, on the side of the engine. Yeah, I see that. That's my cam sensor. What that is used that like to cylinder be. Cylinder right there? Yeah, it used to be on a distributor engine on the older design. This would be where the distributor used to sit. And now they just, um, once they made it a waste spark system, this is now your cam sensor. So yeah, this one's tan and yellow. Tan and yellow is the signal of the cam. See again, we have an orange and a blue. That's the five volt ref yeah. and the ground. And then the other wire is your signal. The fact that these are new. My concern is uh, with the crank sensor because they're adjustable. The cam is not, I cannot back probe this because it's all baked like the connector. Okay, that should be it. Let me start this back up. I'm missing pretty good now. And of course, all I did was touch things.
cranked and cam. Let's go down at a lower time base. All right, so some some other scope stuff, Caleb's not gonna follow this, but um, when you're using the, the snap-on tools, if you want detail and repetition, which is what I want now, not just repetition, I wanna see detail here with my cam and crank. Um, we want to zoom in, like use a smaller time base, and then what you would do is you pause it and zoom out, that'll give us our repetition. And so now we can look at um, all different parts of that. In the green trace, that's the crank signal. And the, the blue trace um, is the cam. So basically they're just pulses that are occurring every time the uh, crank and cam rotate. Yeah. And those are the coordinating signals that the engine computer is looking at to fire these coils. So I have an output problem. I wanna make sure that I don't have an input problem that's me messing up the output. So what I need this to do is I need it to act up again. For those of you that know how to use a scope a little bit more, on the, on the uh, snap-on units, you can only peak detect two channels. I can't peak detect all three, and uh, I really want to um, look at this at a longer time base so I can see it, but because I can't peak detect all three channels, that really limits me, so I have to stay zoomed in. Although what I could do, being the cam signal is less frequent, we can go crank, and crank is green, and then my coil firings, and then, then we can zoom out. I just don't want to miss anything, is really what I'm going after here. What I need this to do is drop one of these coil firing. There we go, right there. Now what I want to look at during that event, right there, Caleb, what we want to look at is did something change in my cam and crank signals? And so you see the green trace, I'm looking up here, right where that my mouse is. Yeah. What I don't uh, like about this particular scope and what we're doing is I'd like to zoom in on that and I can't. And I really need to see these two crank signals in better detail than I have right now. And so that's why, what I need to do to catch that, I really, really need to drop this back down to a, a smaller window. And then I'll turn peak detect off because I don't need it on these smaller time bases. And I need it to do it again. Uh, let me reach across here for a second. I think I saw what I needed to see, Caleb. Our crank signal's dropping out. All right, so where did I rev it in this pattern, right? You, you see where the um, this pattern gets really tight right in here? Yeah. That's where I revved it. So we wanna zoom in on that area and look at, yeah, crank signal's messed up. Okay. Look at, what we should see on the crank is we should see groupings of four. Should be four, 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 and, and that repetition. You see how we're seeing four, and like starting from left to right, they're not all even height. And then look, that one's missing one, yeah. right? The, yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah, a group of three, right? That. It's like four. They should all be the same height too. Um, starting there, that one looks like crap. Actually, the one before it does too. So you only have three there. There's three there, three there. There's four, but it's got a low one. Three, yeah. one, and one. This is a messed up crank sensor. Yeah. This is this is a crank sensor fault. All right. So the that input is bad, and the computer is interpreting that, and it's messing up the coil firing. So if we go a little further ahead, what we should see after those crappy pictures, we should see these coil firing events also getting messed up too. Let's make sure that it is possible that I'm scope aliasing here because I don't see my 
coil is being messed up. I may have misspoken, Caleb. It's possible that our mistriggering on the crank is a sample rate issue. I need to make sure. Let me redo that again. See, I did not have peak detect turned on for my, my crank. Let's do that to make sure we're not missing it. I'm gonna drop my time base down just a little bit more. Snap it one more time. I need this to misfire on me. You guys might have seen something there live. I didn't. Can't do both. Intermittence, gotta love it. If the problem was there all the time, Caleb, this would be a lot easier. There it was right there. Looking to the left of my dotted line in the middle. See how nice and clean everything is? Yeah. Look at your green trace, four, 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 right? Blue trace is, you know, consistent square wave, consistent coil firing events. Remember the coils fire, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? So what we want to really focus on is our inputs during that area. And you can see it. Look at the green trace. We have a crank sensor fault that is that is causing this. The rapid coil, so the inconsistent coil firing. So start over here, right? Where where my um, mouse is or my finger. Consistent ramps, right? One, two, three, one, two, and then all of a sudden There's the that. cams, the crank signal changes. What's the reaction of the computer? So it's input messes up first. Okay. Computer sees that input and that's how it knows where the pistons are when to fire the coils and so it really messes up that calculation and then starts randomly doing weird stuff with the coil packs Th that's why we have misfires on every cylinder that's why we have coil primary circuit faults one two and three um, all related to a faulty crank sensor now the thing about that is it might not be a bad crank sensor it could be an air gap adjustment problem these crank sensors um, would ride on the flywheel. So let me get my hand in the in the camera here. What you would have is these teeth on the flywheel that would be rolling this way, right? And you have a sensor that would sit here and there needs to be an air gap. So as those come past, that's those windows you're seeing. What happens when you change this crank sensor, if you set your air gap down too far, is it'll actually hit the sensor and that's what messes up the signal. That's a common mistake people make when they put these crank sensors in on these just in case I don't get the opportunity to show you guys this crank sensor flywheel the adjustment I have a video that I've done it was on a Dodge Avenger that I did with my class and it is not on my premium channel it's on my regular channel that you guys can watch where I'm I'm messing with the air gap on a crank sensor and showing you exactly what we have here I mean to the to the letter exactly what we have um, so this is either an air gap issue with the crank sensor or uh, it is a faulty crank sensor even though the customer says it was replaced. When was it replaced? I don't know. Uh, let's see what we can do to duplicate this. Um, in the past, what I've done is you can actually put your hand on the crank sensor itself and feel it. And if it's rubbing, you'll have a vibration on this sensor. So that's one way. Um, another way is simply to loosen it, um, shut the vehicle off, loosen the crank sensor, put this sensor all the way down where it hits the flywheel, and then just back it off just a little bit and retighten it and then redo your captures and see if you fix the vehicle. I'm not sure what direction we're going just yet, but we do see the fault in front of us. Awesome, it's an input problem. If I'm in a garage, I'll probably just put a crank sensor in it, not mess around. I don't know, not sure which way I would handle that. I really need to know when this sensor was replaced. All right, so let's leave this roll live. And what I wanna do is trigger off of my crank sensor now. 
No, that's not really any any more helpful. I thought on occasion I was seeing some glitches in that in that uh, green square wave live. I mean, of course we we are. Um, all right, let me get my hands back there. Crank sensor lives in the back on the bell housing area. No way I can show this to you, but my hand is on it. I do not feel any vibrations, so I'm wiggling the harness for the crank sensor. Um, where we are located, at being outside, I can't really do anything back there. Uh, put my hand on it, I don't feel it. Um, I don't feel it hitting. What I'm gonna tell Pete to do is change his crank sensor. There's just nothing more I can do out here. I cannot get back there. What, what really needs to be done is that needs to be unbolted, pull the sensor out, look at it, see if it's got rub marks on it. And uh, for those of you that maybe are watching this again, I wanna remind you, I have a video on this where I'm showing a crank sensor that's rubbing with my classroom. I adjusted it and it does work. If this is your car and you run into something like this where you've just replaced the crank sensor and you're setting uh, these types of fault codes or have these kind of symptoms, the procedure you wanna do, again, get that flywheel, move to a position where there is no window. Remember, we're looking at groupings of four. So we have four slots in three different locations. So what you have is four here, four here, and four here. Every 120 degrees, we have a group of four windows. What you wanna make sure you do is turn the flywheel to a place where there is no windows, where you have straight flywheel. Take your crank sensor, loosen the bolt, push the crank sensor all the way down where it hits, and then back it off a hair and tighten it back down. That's the method for setting up the air gap. A new sensor will actually come with a piece of felt uh, paper on the bottom of the sensor. And what that piece of paper is, or a little sticky piece, is that is your air gap adjustment. So if you're replacing a sensor, all you need to do is put it down to where it hits the flywheel and tighten it. Because once the flywheel turns, it knocks that piece of paper off and you have the proper air gap setting. So that's the procedure you use. There's really no reason for us to go any further with the wiring or anything like that. The five volt raft, the signal, the ground are all concerns, but not when you have a intermittent glitch like what we're dealing with. And that harness from that point over is actually part of the sensor. So I'm not even worried. Even if the harness was rubbing, say, on the back of the block, it doesn't matter. Put a sensor in it, you'll be fine either way. Uh, some bonus footage here for this Jeep with the crank sensor we called. Um, this is the sensor that came out. It actually doesn't look new, but the um, adjustment I was mentioning is this piece of like felt on the end of this that when you replace this sensor, what you're supposed to do again is you line up the flywheel to where there's no notches and you push this down so where it hits the flywheel and then you tighten it up. You can see that this is an elongated bolt that it does have an adjustment and what will happen with these if this piece of felt is not there let me take it off this this basically is your air gap adjustment so the right way to set this is just to simply push it where it hits and then tighten it down this piece of felt this piece of felt will actually almost rub off so it was never hitting so good to see good to see that but um we did replace the sensor and uh, the vehicle is fixed. So, you know, not sure where the fault occurs. That, that's what happens with these sensors a lot. It doesn't matter when it was changed. Uh, the, the last piece, as I'm reviewing the, the footage I did and getting the video ready, um, when that signal glitched on us, it glitched at five volts. So what that means is our signal circuit was good. No problems there because it's a pull down design circuit. And then um, our grounds are shared between other sensors, so I'm not worried about sensor ground. And our reference circuit is also shared, and I'm not worried about that either. So there was really only one fault, which is the sensor itself, or it was rubbing. In this case, it was not rubbing or hitting. This wasn't loose back there, was it, Tim? Like the bolt that was holding this down? It wasn't very, very tight. I mean, no? it didn't take much effort to get it off. Okay. So let's hear this Jeep run. Let's make sure our misfire's gone. I'm not gonna connect the scope up and everything for you guys again, but I wanna make sure that, uh, that our misfire's gone. New crank sensor is installed. What you 
guys listen to it. It didn't misfire initially when I first started it. No more misfire. Faulty crank sensor, was it rubbing? I got to show you guys the little adjustment piece that's on there, that little felt piece of paper. I'm calling it a felt, it's not paper, it's almost like a cushion. Tim had a good question off camera, which was, do we have to worry about that interfering with the signal? And the answer is no, because it's a magnet. You can't shield a magnet with a thin piece of uh, foam or felt or paper. Um, magnetism just goes right through it. So that is your air gap adjustment. Again, air gap's critical in this. This was not an air gap issue, just a faulty sensor. So I'm glad I didn't fart around with out in the parking lot with it 250 degrees and burn my hands just to pull it out to show you there were no rub marks on it. Just a faulty sensor. Uh, some of you guys I know are thinking about, well, the five volt uh, line, the sensor signal, and you know, could you have had a reference problem? Could you have had a ground problem? Uh, those things are legit questions. Grounds and references are shared. Everything else was fine. The only issue would be an open in that harness between the splice and that sensor. And you know, sometimes uh, the amount of testing involved, because of how intermittent that was, the amount of testing involved, once you isolate the circuit, once you know your circuit design, pull up and pull down circuitry, um, make the call. Faulty sensor, they fail all the time. Again, I want to remind you guys of my premium channel, which is my class I teach at Rosedale Technical College. I have the opportunity for you guys to come in on your own pace and watch my classroom lectures. I have hundreds of hours of, of uh, theory, operation, testing. Uh, I mentioned pull up and pull down circuitry on this Jeep and how I know for a fact that my line is at five volts on that signal, that that wire is good from the sensor all the way to the computer because it's a pull down design. That that type of stuff. Fundamental, foundational information. I hope to see you guys there. Click on, click, click on that link right there. 14 day free trial. Hope to see you guys there. Catch you next time.